and I've recommended this case to Tulsa City Crime and I really, really hope they cover it um, because not just they're amazing how they bounce off one another is absolutely flawless but they seem to have the ability to gain so much more information than anybody else as well which for me is a huge kick because I like to go and look things up myself Again, it's from the I Am A Killer series on Netflix, and it's the case of Lindsay Hogan, Sir H-A-U-G-E-N. She says she killed her boyfriend in 2015 because he told her several times he wanted to die. He wanted to be killed. He was so depressed after he came out of this um, rehabilitation program, and he turned to drink again, that he wanted to be killed. Listen to her speak, you're led to believe through her history of abuse, experiences and training that she is a clear victim. She paints a very, very good picture. She's exactly what makes both a psychopath and good television, to be fair, let's be honest. Some of it may be incredible editing to elaborate on key parts. However, she plays a very likeable, loving, friendly character. She does a job very, very well. Even the website imdb.com titles her as a star in the program. I know I'm splitting hairs here and I'm potentially a hypocrite considering I wrote the books about my father killing my mother. And no star can just mean to be starring in. However, it does seem a lot of the times we dramatise these people. And to a degree, it's as though we are condoning the behaviour. I wonder if sometimes with the over-elaborating on people like the Iceman, the extreme killers, we can be making the extreme seem benign. However, let's be honest, I advertise my book as My Father Killed My Mother in 1993. I was 10. I don't start my advertising with I love dancing with my mum or my granddad died by an accident that I caused. Let's do the straight up warning bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about Judith Barcy and her parents. She was a little girl who was killed by her father. I'd have been nine when I ended up in care. My first foster placement was very, very well to do. They had a um, religious foster mother and um, a Welsh gentleman as the father. And they had three children of their own. All their children, all lived together, five bedroom property, it was beautiful. Big conservatory at the back and a farm overlooking, directly opposite. And I was a little terror. I'd gone in effing and blinding, and not a care in the world. And then I'd found out my mother had been killed. And I went through a stage, if you like, of either kicking off completely every little random thing from self-harm into constant nose blowing a mixture of shock and grief up to just remaining silent completely stunned every question not answering having made a point of having no involvement with the family they weren't my family so i had no connection i didn't want a connection even though they were trying to do everything they could and they were looking back as an adult now they were really good people but as a child, I had no interest. I wanted nothing to do with them. I hated them. Um, absolutely detested the fact that they were trying to take the place of my parents or that they were trying to be good to me when my affection, my interaction had been different. Their affection was to put an arm around me or to tap me on the shoulder and make sure I was okay. Whereas I'd gone into the property, terrified of taking my shoes off and getting changed into trainers because I'm thinking I might need to run in case I take a beating. So that's what used to happen at home all the time. So all the time they tried different methods to get me to relax, different ways of incorporating their time with me. And one of the things was to watch this program called The Land Before Time. And it was a cartoon, if you like, a cartoon film, animated film, with dinosaurs in, and it's about if I remember rightly, the same souls are trying to find this family. And it's about being well behaved and understanding. I might be mixing up two of the Land Before Time films here, just due to memory. But I do remember uh, 
as much as I didn't want to be involved and when anybody asked me about not interested in this, not interested in that, I don't care, I don't want to know. I actually got something out of it and it was it was teaching me things. It was teaching me about love and loss and it was teaching me about morals. So sadly, how interesting then that years later I would come across the Judith Barcy case. Judith Barcy played Ducky in The Land Before Time. And we're going to talk a little bit about her story. She was born in 1978 on June 6th to Joseph Barcy. Uh, I'm going to refer to him more than likely as Jealous Joe throughout this. And Monica Barcy. They'd emigrated to California, fleeing the Hungarian People's Republic following the 1956 uprising. Both had had previous marriages. Judith's first role, aged five, was in Fatal Vision as Kimberly MacDonald. Fatal Vision was nominated for Outstanding Drama Comedy Special and Outstanding Makeup Achievement. She later played Thea Brody in Jaws the Revenge, where she says, I'm too young for coffee. Can I drive? She looks like she's having so much fun in the aeroplane scene, where she says, Sometimes my father puts me on his lap and lets me steer the key. She sounds so excited and naturally gets to sit with the pilot from the pilot's seat. Can't read my own writing there. Judith went on to voice Ducky and in one of her lines says, You cannot talk yet, huh? She goes on through the film dialogue to say she hopes her family are at the Great Valley because she lost them at the Great Ground Shake. My name's Ducky. Yep, yep, yep. Don't step on a crack or you'll fight, fall and break your neck. Don't step on a crack or you'll fall and break your neck. It's like one of those kids games. There's this little dinosaur hobbling along. Um, did something similar with my daughter when we do um, step on a nick and you marry a brick and a beetle will come to your wedding. And they do hopscotch, so on and so forth. It's a good childlike thing. And I've put the scenes on my Facebook. There's something magical about looking at life through innocent eyes. I remember, <laughs> I remember having a action man stood up in my bedroom. My granddad having told me a few days before that you can move things with the power of your mind. I remember looking at this action man and thinking it's going to move in a minute, it's going to move. And it did. Didn't touch it, but just concentrating and trying to push with the power of my mind. It moved ever so slightly. And I heard laughing. And I looked over and my granddad was stood in the hallway and he was tapping the floor with his foot to make this action man move. That was a little part of me as a child. Still believed I had that power to make it move. And this, this child, Judith, she exudes that kind of innocence throughout all of her scenes. It's absolutely amazing. I would love to have seen what she could have become. How beautiful it is to be able to immortalise an individual through media. I had less than 10 photographs of my own. As much as I hate my voice, I plan on leaving as much behind for me, for my family. As I can. Judith Barcy, well done, Kidder. Thanks for being epic. She also played Anne in All Dogs Go to Heaven. She says, God bless Mr. Itchy, God bless Charlie, and please help me find a mummy and daddy. Yosef Istrom Barcy, plumbing contractor and fiddler. Born in 1932, November the 26th, never knew his father and was bullied by the children and teachers. He settled in France and had two children, Aggie and a boy called Barna. He turned to drink and abused his wife shortly after they were born. His first daughter, Aggie, speculated that Joseph hated girls as he had blamed his mother for his father leaving them. He was abusive. 
to his wife. Up until the point, they moved to New York in 1964, where he then started to abuse Barno as well. It took his wife Clara five years to be able to get her family out. She moved to Arizona and filed for divorce. Joseph moved to California as a plumber still and met Maria. Maria and Joseph had Judith. She starred in more than 70 commercials and guest roles. As Judith became more famous, Yosef became more violent, jealous and paranoid. He choked his wife, threatened to kill himself, his wife and Judith, and he hit Maria in the face. Yosef stopped drinking but continued to threaten and abuse his wife and daughter. Before Judith mm. left to shoot mm. Jaws, he told her whilst he held the knife, If you choose not to come back, I will cut your throat. Maria stated Joseph would show her where he kept the gasoline and said, If you leave, I will burn the house down. Judith told her best friend that Joseph had thrown pots and pans at her and caused a nosebleed. Judith broke down in front of her agent, who got to a child psychologist who identified severe physical and emotional abuse and reported the findings to Child Protective Services. I'm presuming that's exactly the same as our social services over here in the UK. The case was dropped once Maria said that she would apply for a divorce. Joseph was obsessed with cleanliness. Maria stopped cleaning in a bid to drive him out. Maria told her next door neighbour she would claim Judith's $12,000 tax refund before Yosef could get it. And then she would leave. Judith was last seen Monday the 25th, 1988, whilst riding her bike on the street. That same night, Jealous Joseph shot Judith in the head while she was asleep in her room. Now, I'm stood in my daughter's bedroom and there's a grey bunny on the side on one and a brown monkey teddy on the other. And my last memories of them being in this room was me reading Ten Little Dinosaurs to my youngest um judith donaldson book they're all very good we own all of them they're amazing and she's to the point now that she can memorize them herself she's four years old she can't read yet but she can she can memorize the story and i couldn't imagine laying my hands on my girls let alone taking a gun standing over her and pulling the trigger and i gain a huge kick of every award, every letter, every achievement that they receive. I didn't have a good education. I left school two years in after 100% attendance and gained 100% absence because I went straight into the workplace. Yay, go me. Which did me okay in terms of work experience, did me okay in terms of the qualifications I got through work, but didn't do me any good in understanding maths, English, IT, and so on and so forth until later in life. And I didn't have anybody cheering me on. I used to look up and my parents weren't there. So the idea that I could be jealous of my kids' achievements is it's appalling. Um, my eldest came on with a medal for playing football and they let them keep it for the night and then they have to take it back because the following week it will go to a different child. We had this little agreement that she could forget to take it back into school for an extra night because we were so chuffed that she'd got it. And they get pocket money based on the things that they achieve. So I can't understand that at all in terms of he was jealous of her successes. Yes, the successes are grossly different from this extremely famous little girl who's done incredibly well for herself and her family and my daughter bringing on my middle from football. However, I was bullied in school. 
I had all the, oh, you've, um, your father's a killer, or your mother was killed, or, oh, this happened. 